Frame Raider. The Atari 5200. Released in 1982, this successor to the vastly popular Atari 2600 wasn't met with the most favorable of outcomes. How about those games? Thankfully, it does mostly shine in these areas. While not a world of difference from the Atari 2600, it was certainly an improvement. Atari 5200 games were often identical to Atari 8-bit computer counterparts, in some cases being direct ports. While released earlier, the Atari 8-bit computers were still rather impressive. The Atari 5200 brought that potential to the home console market, but was it enough? While at the time these keypad controllers were seen as a step in the right direction, they have aged terribly in comparison to other preceding systems that took a more simplified approach. But that's not its biggest problem. These controllers are known to be very faulty, and finding a working one is extremely unlikely in the wild. Beyond that, buying one is a gamble because you don't know how long they're gonna work. With a controller so advanced, it plays arcade. Since a working one is so uncommon, they have a rather hefty price tag, often exceeding the cost of the game console itself. Many say the controller killed the 5200, and I tend to agree. It isn't just the failure rate, but people generally seem to dislike its design as well. To this day, besides homebrewers, there is still yet to exist a third-party controller in a modern form factor. Yet most other consoles from this era have some type of easily attainable solution. This would probably be quite easy to do granted the 6-pin connector, except the 5200 doesn't have that, instead having a 15-pin connector, thus making everything more complicated. Most people have since given up on the system, it seems, which is probably why it has a total lack of modern support. Nonetheless, I feel this library of games has gone severely overlooked. There aren't that many games for the system, so I thought why not document and shortly give my opinion on all of them. Is the system worth investing in? I believe this should help us find out that answer. Just so we're clear, I am covering only the official commercial released games during the system's initial run. No homebrew, no hacks, just the authentic experience. I'm trying not to delve too much into the history of these games either, though in some cases that's pretty well required. I'll try to summarize these games by just giving the basics being what it is, if it demonstrates decent graphical fidelity for the system, and if I like them. Why do the graphics matter? Well, 5200 games play pretty similarly to the generations before it. The only real improvement between 2600 and 5200 was graphics, so considering that emphasis, I think it's worth talking about. Alright, let's get to it. We'll be going alphabetically starting with the only A-titled game for the system, Astro Chase. In Astro Chase, the player is given a small area in which to safeguard planet Earth from incoming mines. If one reaches the Earth, it's toast, so you gotta get rid of those mines as fast as possible. Graphically, it's quite impressive with the surrounding planets and stars, although I'm pretty sure there aren't multiple Saturns surrounding Earth. It does have a neat intro cinematic. It's a pretty good game. In Ball Blazer, you're put up against your opponent in what is essentially a game of futuristic soccer. Shockingly, this puts you in the first-person perspective. I believe this is a two-player-only game with no CPU opponent. Impressive graphics, gameplay has weight to it, this is a great game. In Beam Rider, you get placed on a grid with five rows to swap between. Enemies spawn from above and you'll have to shoot at them once they get close enough. Over time, more types of hazards appear. Graphics are somewhat superior to the 2600, but nothing incredible. The game itself, though? Very fun. This game is great. In Berserk, you're attempting to escape a facility filled with robots. Shoot them if you can and make your way out to an exit before the evil auto spawns in. Graphics are simple, but intended to be that way. Berserk uses voice synthesizers, which is cool to hear emanating from the 5200. This game is good. In Blueprint, you gotta save your girlfriend from being attacked by this monster up here. To do so, you'll visit neighborhood homes in hopes that they have spare parts for your machine, which you'll put together to shoot the monster. Some homes will have bombs, which you'll have to carry to the pit on the bottom right. Gotta love this one's graphics. Very charming. Bounty Bob Strikes Back is a sequel to another 5200 game we have yet to look at called Miner 2049er. This is essentially a difficult expansion pack for the game, in a manner of speaking. For what it attempts to deliver, it's fine. We'll save the comments for Miner 2049er. Buck Rogers' Planet of Zoom is frequently laggy, coming to a crawl when multiple foes appear on screen. Controls were sloppy to the point where any movement felt like I was on ice. Regardless, the gameplay consists of either running through these stations or destroying enough enemies to count down the UFOs listed under the fuel. You have altitude in this game, as you can raise and lower yourself. The higher you are, the faster you go. I suppose this game would have been good if the controls were better and the collision detection was a bit more fair. Sorry, I found this to be an average game at best. Centipede is a game where you, a tiny turret, are to shoot an incoming massive centipede by shooting its limbs off one by one. Levels repeat with different color variations. In terms of graphics, it's simple, but for such a concept, there isn't much you can do in that department. To me, it comes close to great, but sticks at a high good. 
In Choplifter, you have to save your fellow comrades who are currently in the arms of the enemy. Many types of resistance will try to stop you from saving their hostages, but given the right moment, it's easy to swoop in and take them back to home base. There's a certain Vector-esque style to its graphics that I find aesthetically pleasing, but that's just me. The game is great! Congo Bongo seems pretty fun on the surface, and while it does have its potential, the physics are practically broken. It's an easy game in concept, just climb the environment and make your way to the monkey while dodging obstacles. Most of the time you'll be scratching your head, however, wondering how you died. Fun cartoony graphics, frustrating gameplay. I'd say it's good, but only by a small margin. Countermeasure is an interesting one. You pilot a tank collecting clues to a nuke code that you'll eventually have to use to disarm said code. There are three letters to collect in the map. For some reason, they look like detached Roman columns. It tries to go for a more realistic approach graphically, but turns out looking like a bunch of tiny stencil art pieces, which has its charm. Not really my sort of game, but I still enjoyed it. It's a good game. Decathlon you play by breaking your 5200 controller. Jitter the controller left to right endlessly until it's busted. The graphics do what they need to, no complaints. The game itself? I suppose it's good, but don't even bother with it on real hardware, because it's quite literally a gamble for your money. Defender has you piloting a ship designed for the protection of citizens from oncoming aliens, who will attempt to latch onto them to take them home for experimentation. Try to shoot these aliens before they pick up your people. But if not, shoot the ship and save the human as it falls to the surface. Shooting them all dead finishes the wave. For a space game, it has quite a bit of detail in its graphics, which makes it look rather polished. It's a great game that I never personally loved, but I can't deny its greatness and quality gameplay. In Dig Dug, you use a pump to inflate your foes like balloons until they pop. You have to make your way to them first, however, which is done by digging into their ruts. Enemies can travel through the dirt in a ghostly form. Pretty advanced graphics for the system, though the enemies could have done with a better presentation than a single solid color. This is an excellent game. Dreadnought Factor. In this game, you get a multitude of ships in which to take down a giant oncoming mothership. You've got laser missiles and bombs for surface level targets. You can't move backwards, only forwards. The ship is actively traveling towards your planet, so you can't take too long or it'll come and blow it up. This is one of the best games on the 5200. It is simply excellent. In Frogger, you hop from tile to tile to get to the other side, repeated five times. Watch out for hazards like sinking turtles, snappy crocodile mouths, and more. My question is, why do you move the analog stick around to position yourself, and press a button to move? Hasn't been like that in any previous Frogger game. I'm settling it good for this one. I feel that Frogger 2 3 Deep puts too many eggs in one basket. Individually, the graphics are pretty good, but it all adds up to be a bit of a mess. It's too crowded. Also, it isn't nearly as easy to jump into, with a whole bunch of new rules, many of which not making much sense. It's not quite bad, but I wouldn't say it's good. The logical step is to call it average. Galaxian. This port is fine, but the hit sound kind of kills it for me. It's just so... weak. I don't know. Plus, everything looks squished to fit the screen. I think this could have been better. Gorf is a mishmash of popular space shooters like Space Invaders and Gyrus, for example. Each mission has a new style of gameplay. Graphics-wise, it's rather pathetic. I think this is made up for in the gameplay, which is very well done. This game is great. Gremlins is a game where you collect the innocent Mogwai and transport them to safety. Some Mogwai have transformed into Gremlins, which you'll have to dispose of with your sword. While I question why everything has a piss filter, its graphics are phenomenal. Unlike most games of its time, the player looks like an actual human being, instead of a bunch of messy pixels slapped together. This is my favorite game of the 5200 library. It's excellent. Gyrus is a space shooter that takes inspiration from Tempest with its 360 degree movement around the playing field. I could never get into the way this game controls. Moving from the lower half to the upper half of the screen always felt flimsy. I'd still say it achieves graphically, with texture work on every moving entity, but I find it to be an average game. Hero is an innovative yet simple maze-based platformer where you'll have to make it from point A, insertion, to point B, rescue. On your way through its many tunnels, you'll spot crazy creatures and giant stone walls to detonate by pressing down on the control stick. The hero himself is a bit simple, though the environments make up for it. Still, I'd be lying if I said he doesn't look out of place here. Regardless, the game is excellent. James Bond 007 is rather strange. You press one button to shoot both above and below you, despite there being a set of two buttons on the 5200 controller. I I I shoot the diamonds out the sky! Watch for the satellites that attempt to blow up the land before you. The gameplay is fine, lots of design variety. I'd say the game is good. Joust is basically Balloon Fight's Origins. 
You'll fly around on giant buzzards, attempting to ram into the vulnerable points of your opponents before they do you. Once achieved, collect the buzzard egg quickly or you'll be dealing with them all over again, in a sense. The environment changes every few waves. Environments look great in Joust, though like with Hero, the players themselves could have done with some extra work. Regardless, the contestants can't take away from the truth, being that this is an excellent game. Jungle Hunt is a game about a guy swinging through a jungle. The goal is to make your way through the various hazardous landscapes, like jungle ropes, crocodile-infested waters, rocky hills, and more. For the most part, you just press the button at the correct time. The game itself? It's okay. I found its biggest problem is hit detection. In Kaboom, you're navigating baskets around to catch the bombs a prisoner is using to break out of jail. If you miss one, you lose a basket. This game requires very precise movements of the controller to get right. As they land in your basket, 1812 Overture plays, because why not? In terms of graphics, for the 5200 it's an absolute flop. But the gameplay is solid, and beloved by classic Activision fans everywhere. I can't deny that Kaboom is a great game, but this adaptation is a little underwhelming. In Kangaroo, you play as a kangaroo. You've got quite a spring in your step, as well as boxing gloves. Make it to the top to reunite with your lost son. You can box out your enemies if they're getting in the way. There's fall damage and that feels unnecessary, but that's pretty much it. Graphics don't impress, but it's still a good game. Keystone Capers has you chasing down a criminal who's escaped. Catch up to him before he makes it out of the building. Many hazards will get in your way as you make it from floor to floor. The graphics are quite nice with detailed environment pieces taking up the background space, but yes, it's certainly not too impressive. Still, a great game. k Razy Shootout is just a clone of Berserk. There are slight variations to the concept, you move around a lot faster, and there's a time limit. It's sad we couldn't have seen some other arcade clone that didn't end up on the 5200 instead of this. In Mario Bros, you're cleaning up the sewers by removing the pests. Jump underneath them, then jump onto the platform above and kick them off. Clear a predetermined number of enemies and the wave clears. The enemies add new gimmicks to consider the further you go. Mario's physics are flimsy, specifically jumping and changing directions. Though the game does have graphical fidelity on its side with accurate interpretations of their counterparts. A well-crafted game in terms of visuals, but I can't say the same for the gameplay, which I found to be average. In Mega Mania, you gotta shoot a bunch of space debris that also happens to be food. Each wave has a unique pattern associated to it, making the longevity of the game non-repetitive. The enemies are fairly detailed and resemble their intended design. Very easy to pick up and play, always making for great fun. This is an excellent game. Meteorites is a clone of the game Asteroids. You pilot a triangular ship shooting these asteroids, avoiding the many sub-asteroids they create upon impact. You can warp out of the playing field temporarily, then be spawned back in elsewhere. Good for when you find yourself too close to an incoming asteroid. The graphics are quite good considering the nature of it, though some extra background details would have been nice. This is a good game. Minor 2049er is what comes before Bounty Bob Strikes Back. You play as Bounty Bob, who will traverse many platforms. Once he's successfully explored the entire area, the mission is complete and you'll move on to the next one. Visited platforms are indicated by the solid color added to them. There are enemies you'll have to either avoid or eliminate by picking up items, which act like power pellets from Pac-Man. Missile Command is a defense game where you'll use your missiles to create an explosion radius capable of destroying other incoming missiles from your opposition. Missiles can cluster and disperse, which causes more problems for you. It's a game of pre-anticipatory shooting. Many things here could have been improved upon texture-wise. The gameplay is, however, solid and enjoyable. This is a great game. Montezuma's Revenge is an early example of 2D platforming. The game's title also stands for Visitor's Diarrhea. I'm not making that up. Collect keys to open doors, and weapons to bypass creepy crawlers. This is my favorite version of the game. I love its graphics and sound. In that case, the graphics are great and the gameplay is even better. This is an excellent game. Moon Patrol takes you on a moon adventure. Like James Bond 007, you have two firing functions, yet both fire from a single button press. In this game, you'll jump small caverns and shoot at oncoming UFOs. You'll have to speed up and slow down according to your situation. You'll get a checkpoint every so often where you can restart from. New areas will have different backdrops, so in terms of graphics, it's alright. Mountain King is a very strange game that starts off with probably the best introduction of any game ever. You'll traverse a bunch of nearby mountains in search of some kind of tomb that you'll need to collect a treasure from, then take it to the top of the mountain to win. You can use your flashlight to identify hidden treasures along the way. 
which when nearby, the game plays a jingle from Anitra's dance. The graphics are quite simple, but it renders a lot on screen at once, so you can't really fault it. I don't expect to try this game out myself again, but I will admit it's a pretty good game. Mr. Dew's Castle has you exploring a small vertical area where you need to get rid of the surrounding foes. This is done by slamming a floor panel down in front of you at just the right time. You can swap ladder positions, which is good for getting away in a dire situation. It's a pretty nice looking game despite the enemies being a single color. The gameplay? It's average. Miss Pac-Man is an expanded upon concept of Pac-Man. Like with the other games mentioned earlier, it'd be better to talk about the original first. I will say though that Miss Pac-Man involves the system in a natural way, providing changes in level design and a more polished presentation overall. Its graphics are good here, and this is an excellent game. Pac-Man is the original, where you must find your way around the maze, collecting pellets as you go. Collect them all and you win the stage. There are four power pellets that allow you to temporarily get rid of the ghosts chasing you around the maze by devouring them. The game looks inferior to Miss Pac-Man, but comparing it to the previous Pac-Man home experience, this is League's superior. This is a great game, but as any seasoned arcade player will tell you, Miss Pac-Man is the superior choice. Our good pal Pango here is doing his best to prevent the snow bees from performing... non-consensual acts? Creatively manipulate your environment to push ice blocks into them to ram them into whatever hard surface exists behind them. Snow bees spawn out of ice blocks, which if paying attention to upon starting a wave, can be spotted then eliminated before they emerge. The game's graphical presentation is quite good. The gameplay is exciting due to the creativity required to take down your enemies. This is an excellent game. Pitfall is a relatively simple game where you'll move from one side of the screen to the next, collecting the rare treasure here and there, jumping over the mouths of crocodiles, and swinging between giant bottomless pits. Unlike its sequel, this one has lives, so do be careful. The game has great graphics for the 5200, for example those trees that have visible branches. The gameplay is entertaining, but gets repetitive very quickly. Still a great game to revisit from time to time. Pitfall 2 Lost Caverns is the highly ambitious sequel to the relatively simple Pitfall game. The concept was highly expanded on, giving the Pitfall character far more to explore. Now there's underground locations, rivers, and more. There exists checkpoints you can activate, which you'll return to upon taking damage. There are no lives to worry about. Pitfall 2 is great. Pole Position is a Formula 1 racer where you'll have to switch gears occasionally depending on the situation. I find the only genuinely nice looking thing in the game is the mountains you see in the distance, and maybe the clouds. Pole Position hasn't aged as well as other racers, but it was a hit in its time. Popeye must collect Ascending Hearts from Olive in this 5200 game. While doing so, many elements will stop him, like his faux Bluto, and, um, pots. You can get a temporary power-up to get rid of Bluto, which is probably spinach? You can even knock a giant barrel on top of Bluto by hitting this trigger here at the right time. Collect enough hearts and you'll go to the next stage. If it weren't for the process of collecting hearts taking so dang long, this would get a better score, but as it is, it's a good game. Qbert is a potty mouth thing who jumps from tile to tile in an isometric perspective. Jump on every tile to get to the next stage. Watch out for the coiled snake and boulders. The game looks alright on the 5200, but character sprites could have done with some improvement. Q-Bird is an excellent game that takes some time to master, but is ultimately very rewarding. Kix is a very unique game where you're tasked with isolating a very dangerous rod that is basically spiraling out of control. You'll create shapes around it which will then be filled in. If the rod touches you or the line you're creating, you lose a life. Due to the rod's sporadic movement, this can prove to be quite a challenge. This is an excellent game that consistently puts your skills to the test. Quest for Quintana Roo is confusing to say the least. Even after reading the manual, I'm still not entirely sure what the goal is here. You're some kind of tomb raider searching for treasure, using stuff you find along the way to uncover new secrets. Once in a tomb, you only have a set amount of time left until you've run out of oxygen. It would take some time to figure out what's going on here, and I don't really have that kind of time. Graphically, this game isn't gonna blow you away. I'm sure Quest for Quintana Roo would be interesting for some, but not for me. I can't really give an opinion based on that. Real Sports Baseball if you don't know how to play baseball, I'm not about to explain it. This is actually really well done. It even has a voice synthesizer. Didn't care for the sound of the audience, though. Its graphics are awesome. I like how you can see the entire perspective of the field at all times. This is a great interpretation of baseball on the 5200. Real Sports Football. This one is... well, not so great. Everyone's a solid color. The background is basically a solid color. Real Sports Soccer. At least better than the last game. Better graphics with actual details on the players. More sound effects, too. In gameplay terms, it feels a bit too slow. It takes forever to get from one side to the other. It's average. Real Sports Tennis. You whack a ball back and forth. 
It controls well, it's fair, though I'm not overly fond of these graphics. They seem to be playing in an eternal void. Everything inside the playing field though, not too bad. This is a good one. Rescue on Fractalus. Had no idea what to expect with this one. Man, was I blown away by what I saw. Actual fake 3D on the 5200 that has a semblance of a real environment? No way! The goal of the game has something to do with picking up little alien creatures and taking them to safety, while the planet's surface defenses and unusual aircraft track you down. There's a certain entertainment factor in ambitious games on very limited hardware. These are without a doubt the best graphics on the system, on a technical scale anyways. But yeah, it is just a bunch of the same color defined by pixel work. The game itself is fine. Most of the enjoyment comes from its existence, honestly. On a gameplay scale, I'd say it's good, just not something I'd revisit for the gameplay alone. In River Raid, you cause havoc. Despite the chaos, be sure not to run out of fuel. Hover over these fuel tanks here before running out to keep that gas meter up. Anything green is danger for you, so keep on the path of the river. You can accelerate or slow down by pulling up or back on the joystick. They really thought of the details here for its graphics. There's mud along the river, different shades of grass, all the game needs really. While the roster of enemies aren't exactly impressive, the landscapes help the game feel more complete. This is an excellent game. Robotron 2084. You can actually use two controllers for this game as it's a twin stick shooter. Wasn't able to set that up myself though. Luckily one controller works, but the gameplay really suffers this way as you'll then be moving towards your enemies as you shoot them. Your goal is to shoot the surrounding robots while trying to collect the last remaining human families to keep them under protection. The graphics are quite good for what they're meant to represent, and the sheer number of enemies on screen at once is impressive. This is an excellent game. Space Dungeon is, like Robotron, a twin stick shooter. I've heard this is one of the best games the system has to offer. Unfortunately I, again, couldn't experience this the way it was meant to be played. With a single controller you shoot in the bottom right direction and I wasn't able to figure out how to shoot in another direction. You'll travel from room to room to find bonuses and attack, or evade, the foes that spawn in. For a space game, the graphics are appropriate. I didn't get the full experience, but I would assume this to be an excellent game. In Space Invaders, you shoot down rows of aliens. Unlike the original, now aliens will first travel from the left to the right of the screen, rather than appearing automatically at the start of a level. It doesn't impress graphically, but the animations are nice. Space Shuttle is a simulation game that I don't really have the right to critique. Allegedly, it can take hours to master it, and I wasn't really willing to take that up just for this video. Supposedly in this game you have to successfully make it to space, then back again. Can't really give this any type of rating, it is what it is. Star Raiders is another impressive title that goes for a bit of a 3D perspective. Emphasized in its gameplay, you travel the galaxy and take down hostile aliens. It's quite entertaining even for someone like me who could never quite seem to get the appeal. I'm not the best person to reference for this one. Lots of people love it, so I suppose it's great, but I personally can't share that love. Star Trek Strategic Operations Simulator I guess this game is like a flat Star Raiders, at least that's what I got from it. You're clearing sectors by eliminating all nearby threats and avoiding hazards like space rocks, all the while monitoring nearby star bases to make sure the enemies aren't inflicting damage to them. Hard to critique this one on its graphics since it clearly wasn't trying to be anything remarkable. It's an average game. Star Wars Return of the Jedi Death Star Battle has you piloting the Millennium Falcon, taking down nearby resistance until a gap in the Death Star Force field is found, where you'll then need to try to get through. Once you get there, you shoot at the Death Star until you've exposed the core, then shoot at that core and blam. That's really all there is to it. Lots of great sound effects in this one. Visually, it looks alright. The ships are solid colors, but the scale of them is rather tiny, so it makes sense. Fun game for a couple rounds, but not something I'd ever play long sittings of. It's good. Star Wars The Arcade Game takes a similar approach. In fact, it's yet another attack on the Death Star, but this time in the X-Wing, similarly to the film. The game's controlled via a crosshair that you can move around the screen. You can move the ship around by pulling the crosshair over to any side. Shoot down some TIE fighters, destroy the surface defenses, go through the tunnel, and shoot into the core. I have to mention this is inspired by the arcade game of the same name, which is vector-based. Likely the reason for it looking like this on the 5200. At the time, I imagine this was remarkable for the sense of immersion to the associated film, but as a game on its own, it's still remarkable. Super Breakout has a number of different modes that differentiate it from your traditional tile-breaking title. Move your paddle left to right and line up with your ball to continue the game of simple back and forth. Graphics? Yep, it has them. That's all you really need to say. Gameplay? It's got it. I can only recommend this game with a trackball. Then it's a great game. Super Cobra is the sequel to the arcade hit Scramble. It's considered a harder game overall, but to compensate they let you start off where you've lost all your lives, should you get a game over. You pilot a helicopter invading caverns filled with enemy artillery, while trying to shoot out as much of it as possible. 
It has a fuel meter, which is filled by blowing up gas tanks below. The graphics are good in this one. Looks great and plays great. Just take some time to get used to navigating this tiny environment and shooting at just the right time to align your bombs and targets. Great game. In Vanguard, you have to evade or attack hordes of enemy ships while trying to get to the end of the tunnel. This continues in waves until you defeat or lose to the boss. Your ship can fire in four directions. Vanguard has unlimited continues, but your score is dumped for each five lost lives. The problem I have is this game's lack of diagonal movement. This makes the gameplay just feel wrong. The original played this way, but that had far less screen crunching than the 5200's port here. The graphics are quite simple, only superior to its 2600 counterpart in a few aspects. On the 5200 it's good, but minor tweaks could have made it excellent. A user known as Zool on Atari Age has since made a hack that adds diagonal movement to the Atari 8-bit computer port, which is the same game as far as I can tell, that being the case for most cross-5200 8-bit computer games. Said hack is now my definitive choice for playing Vanguard. In Wizard of War, you navigate a small maze while shooting the many creatures that have spawned in. They'll shoot with their own weaponry, so be cautious. After a couple more intimidating encounters, you'll come across the Wizard of War himself, who teleports around the maze, making it very difficult to catch him. For some reason, this game requires you to be plugged into the second controller slot. I'm guessing that was a programming mistake. Graphics are fairly standard, looks fine, but nothing special. Credit where it's due, still a good game. Zaxxon is a scary game to some because it challenges not only their skill, but depth perception. In this isometric shooter, you'll be destroying enemy artillery atop large spaceships, going from one to another within between space battles. Navigation is very focused on height and proper adjustment to proceed through its many hazards. This is a great looking game on the 5200 that pulls all the stops. Everything looks like what they're meant to represent. It's a good one. Zenji. A bit of a pipe dream scenario going on with this one. You're a small disembodied head moving through pipes to turn them in such a way that connects the series together. Which then, I guess, drains out the sewage? Eventually you're met with level hazards that are more frustrating than innovative to the gameplay. I need to take a moment to pause and think, but the enemies charging for me prevent that. I think they could have done a lot more with this. Gameplay is good, but not much can be said above that. Zone Ranger is sort of like Bosconian in a way. You have to follow these generator beams to find other generators, shooting them as you go to completely disable the circuit. Like any game of this type, enemies will spawn in attempting to stop you. There's this strange maze you might find yourself accidentally falling into, and I'm unsure what that was about. Now this is a good looking space shooter for the 5200. Detailed enemy sprites, an actual background. I don't think anything in this game is just a solid color. The gameplay isn't bad, but fairly repetitive, since you're more or less doing the same thing over and over. Manages to be fun enough to consider it good. And those are the 69 officially released titles for the Atari 5200. Yes, I know, it's the funny number, haha. Ha. Now that we've all had our laugh, how does the library of the 5200 hold up? Frankly, I'm surprised. For such an underappreciated console, it has quite a few gems. Considering those without arcade counterparts, you've got Dreadnought Factor, Gremlins, Hero, Mega Mania, Montezuma's Revenge, and River Raid, which are all excellent. Then you have great games like Beam Rider, Keystone Capers, both the Pitfall games, Real Sports Baseball, if that's your thing, Star Raiders, personally not my thing, and Super Breakout. 13 of the 69 games are well worth recommending, and even below those are some pretty great ones too. You might not think that's a lot, but that's nearly 20% of the library. Many will tell you the 5200 was underwhelming because of how many 2600 games were repurposed on the system. Here's Pac-Man on ColecoVision, but here's Pac-Man for the Atari 5200 Super System. Considering that, how many of these awesome games weren't on the 2600? Dreadnought Factor, Gremlins, at least not this version of the game, Real Sports Baseball, which exists but the presentation is leaps and bounds better on the 5200, so I wouldn't be able to exclude that from this list. That makes three games. Oh. Back in its day, the 5200 understandably didn't do very well. If your dealer's sold out, keep trying. We're making them as fast as we can. What? Paying a large sum for what you feel you pretty much already had access to isn't all that appealing. I like the Atari 5200. I enjoyed my time exploring what its library had to offer, and I do think the system is underrated. But this lack of popularity makes sense. It had far too many complications like the failing controllers, similar games, and requirement of buying the new console over their old one. So should you consider picking up a 5200? Well, no, not yet anyways. I don't recommend it simply for the controller aspect. Don't go out spending a fortune on a controller that might only last you a couple of days. It's just not a gamble worth investing in. There were alternatives, like the Master Play controller adapter that would let you use 2600 or Genesis controllers. I would say it's a must-have for the 5200, but unfortunately it is ridiculously expensive. So for the moment I say, why bother? 
I bought a 5200 because I know eventually a better solution will come. Third parties have covered many retro consoles, so it'll only be so long until the 5200 is realized, right? Now, I'm sure you've been wondering, how did I capture these games if I don't even have a 5200 controller? That's thanks to the excellent Altera emulator. You might think this was a sacrilegious attempt considering it used emulation to cover the system, and usually I would agree with you there. The only thing I feel I truly missed out on was the controller. Everyone says this controller sucks, and it does. But I've never even held a 5200 controller before. They're so rare. I'm quite familiar with the Intellivision and ColecoVision controllers, and compared to those, it looks like a step above. However, this one requires you hold it upright, so I've been told, which causes cramping. I recently stumbled across an electrical engineer who creates Atari Jaguar controller conversions for the 5200. I decided to buy one. $79.99, so not cheap, but at least I'll have a way to play the system, and I imagine building this thing isn't cheap to start with. I haven't gotten to it yet, just ordered it as I'm writing this, in fact. I don't have any physical carts for my 5200 yet either, so that's something I'd have to wait on regardless. I'm excited to see how it plays on the system, so thank you all for watching, stay tuned for more retro gaming shenanigans like this one, and I'll catch you next time.